thanks again for, for waiting for such a long time. And we hope this will be a great webinar and learning and discussion with all of you. Um, before we start with the webinar, I, I want to keep it short because we already lost some time, but I would like to introduce ourselves and tell you a bit about NIREX before we start. So um, we have been um, at NIREX uh, for more than 20 years now, been designing and manufacturing innovative, you know, user-friendly and also powerful as NIRS research solutions. And with that, our focus is always to provide researchers with training and also the best support, of course, but also with collaborative environments so that you all can focus on the amazing research you're all doing there. So this webinar is one of the examples of that effort, and we are happy to have you here. Um, our FNIR solutions are invented, uh, designed, and also manufactured here in Berlin, where I am, but they are distributed by a network of our amazing distributors worldwide. So they're everywhere. Uh, if you'd like to connect with us, just follow us on any of the um, common platforms, uh, social media platforms, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera. But you can also just subscribe to our newsletter. You will get, get there the latest updates and news uh, on our products and new releases. And we also don't bombard you with emails. We promise you just get three or four per year. So um, we are looking forward to hearing from you and subscribing to our newsletter. With me today um, is my amazing team, Alina and Kemi, who put it all her efforts now in having our speaker joining this meeting. So thank you very much for this. And they will also make sure that everything runs smoothly behind the scenes during this webinar. Thank you again very much for this. And um, before we start, I would like to have a few housekeeping rules with you. So during the webinar, you will be muted, but you can ask questions at any um, time and you can just use the Zoom chat for this and we will collect the questions um, to ask at the end of the webinar. And uh, the content will be made available through our website in the upcoming days and then you can just rewatch the webinar as you like. And for any questions that we cannot answer in the end or yeah, we didn't get to them, you can just um, write us at consulting at nirex.net or support at nirex.net, and then we'll make sure that Franzi receives those questions and they will be answered. So now I have the honor to uh, introduce Franziska Klein to you, um, who's our speaker today. So Franziska Klein received a PhD in 2022 at the University of Oldenburg, and her research focus lies on the development and validation of FNIS. Um, based uh, real-time applications, for example, neurofeedback and BCI, but she is always constantly improving and uh, developing uh, signal processing techniques further. And um, this webinar will be um, about one of these topics. Uh, and now she just started a new position at the health division of the Office Institute for Information Technology in Oldenburg, where she's working on combining EEG and FNIS for real-time applications. And she also works at the RWTH Aachen and transfers her knowledge uh, to clinical applications. So Franzi, really a lot of things um, you're doing right now. And now I'm very much forward looking to the webinar, to your talk and learning about short channel and physiological um, artifact correction. So I hand over the mic to you and stop sharing. Mm, thank you. I cannot share my screen. I'm not allowed to do that. Yeah, now you should do. Three, yes. Okay. Yeah. So you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Okay. And also the correct ones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. So yeah, hello everyone from my side and thanks for having me. Thanks for the nice introduction, of course, and uh, thanks for joining the Journal Club and um, also for waiting. <laughs> so today I will present um, a paper that is um, that was published last year and um, that's called Performance Comparison of Systemic Activity Correction and FNIS for Methods with and Without Short Distance Channels. And um, yeah, this project is primarily motivated, as Fina already mentioned, um, by the fact that we are interested in real-time applications such as new feedback and VCI, for example, in the context of <clears throat> neurorehabilitation for stroke patients or patients with Parkinson's disease. 
And um, due to several reasons, um, the good spatial specificity, the repeatability, low cost, and so on, we think that FNIS is a very good tool for this purpose. However, FNIS also has some challenges or comes with some challenges. And um, one is the sensitivity of the signal to hemodynamic changes of non-neuronal origin, which include task-evoked and non-evoked exocerebral systemic activity. For instance, cardiac pulsation, respiration, myer waves, and so on, but also changes in blood pressure and skin blood flow. And um, these artifacts are known to highly influence the FNIS signal as it can mimic and mask the true task-evoked hemodynamic response. Um, moreover, it can show heterogeneous and homogeneous spatial patterns. It can differ between and within subjects as well as between and within tasks. And also HBO and HBR can be affected differently, which makes it a very challenging artifact to remove. So at the moment, um, the best solution for correcting this exocerebral um, systemic um, uh, activity, which I from now on will only call systemic activity, is a hardware-based solution called short distance channels. So for adults, um, a, system, um, a short distance channel is generated by arranging a sewers and a detector at a distance of less than one centimeter and optimally at a distance of around eight millimeters. And because the depth penetration of an FNIS channel is roughly half um, the source detector distance, a short distance channel is therefore mostly sensitive to activity in the extracerebral tissue. So accordingly to when we want to correct um, the mixture um, of the artifact and the true brain um, related activity as measured with the normal or regular distance channels, we can use the information from the source, dis uh, source detector, um, short distance channel, sorry, that capture mostly the artifact. Um, yeah, we can use that information to restore um, the true brain signal um, by using, for instance, regression-based methods. So this artifact is, of course, a general problem, but it is particularly problematic for BCI and new feedback applications because if we, um, if the real-time correction is insufficient, the setup usually runs on noise instead of brain activity, and that is definitely nothing you want. Unfortunately, in real-time scenarios, um, the short-distance cor um, channel corrections is still rarely performed, um, presumably due to the limited access to the required hardware. However, if no short-distance channels are available, then there are also alternative approaches that exist and that can be used. So accordingly, the aim of this study was to compare online applicable systemic activity correction methods with and without short distance channels on a single trial basis and based on quality measures that quantify signal improvement in spatial specificity. So for this project, we used two data sets, both collected with a NEARX near scout system with 16 normal channels and eight short distance channels covering the supplementary motor area, left and right primary motor cortex. And data set one was used mainly to generate semi-simulated data using three minutes of resting state data from 23 older adults. And we added a canonical HRF in the channels um, six and eight to generate the semi-simulated data. Data set two was a um, real data set, if you want, um, consisting of motor execution and motor imagery data from 24 healthy older adults. Um, but for this presentation today, I will only focus on the motor execution data. The trial structure um, in both data sets was a simple block design with 15 seconds task period followed by a jitter at 18 to 22 seconds rest period. Um, both data sets, so the resting state data and the motor execution, motor imagery data set have been quality checked. So the channels have been quality checked with the QT NES2 box and the poor quality channels have been removed accordingly. And since the short distance channels were of particular importance in this study, um, only those data sets were analyzed in which all of the eight short distance channels had sufficient data quality, which was the, um, already the case for the 24 and 23 subjects I mentioned before. 
And the raw data was then converted into optical density changes, and then we corrected for possible motion artifacts and converted, of course, to hemoglobin concentration changes. And the resting state data at this stage um, was used, as I said, to generate the semi-simulated data. And finally, data of both data sets were bandpass filtered. So the data at this stage from both data sets, um, so until the bandpass filter served as a baseline, and that's what we call no systemic activity correction. That's the data set. Um, we selected, in general, um, systemic activity correction methods that are easy to implement in the real-time scenario and compared them to this data set. And for the methods without short distance channels, we used the common average reference filter for which we subtracted from each channel the average signal across all other channels. Then we had the global component removal um, and the spatial filter developed by Tsang and colleagues. And for the methods with short distance channels, we used um, the short separation regression um, by Zaga and Berger by using for each normal channel, the spatially closest short distance channel. So always one channel involved in this correction. And then we had the GLM all method where we included all short distance channels of both HBO and HBR as regressors. And finally, we had a reduced version of this method where we basically pretended to only have two short distance channels, one on each hemisphere. And here we decided to use channel four and seven because they were included in all region, in all three regions of interest. So then on all of these data sets, we performed a GLM analysis, but for channel selection, we um, used only the GLM all corrected data because um, it was expected to be the most accurate correction method, and we wanted to have the same channel um, for a better comparison across all methods. So for each task, we selected the channel with the highest um, beta value for oxy and the lowest beta value for deoxy separately for each region of interest. And here you see the resulting channel frequency for each task and for HBO and each HBR. So afterwards, um, so for each of the selected channels and each single trial, um, we epoched the data, the, the time series, minus five to 25 seconds around stimulus onset and baseline corrected it. And then we selected different quality measures in order to quantify signal improvement and spatial specificity. So regarding the um, signal improvement, we calculated the scaled root mean squared error. That is the root mean squared error of the linear model fit between the scaled HBO or HBR signal and the scaled canonical HRF. Then we had the um, Spearman correlation between HBO or HBR and the canonical HRF. And then we, um, we Fisher Z transformed the, the correlation values um, for statistical analysis. And then finally, we had the contrast to noise ratio um, for which we used the baseline data and the data of the peak plus minus two seconds. Um, with respect to spatial specificity, um, we calculated single tri correlation matrices consisting of the normal channels, so here in white, um, of each method. And then the, um, and added here in the upper corner, um, top corner, always the short distance channels from the uncorrected data. And finally, we added a topographical beta map for each method consisting of the average beta values from the respective GLM output. So note that this is the only quality measure that is not based on single trials, but on the whole time series. So coming to the results here in terms of signal improvement, we expected that all corrected signals will show signal improvement um, compared to the uncorrected data. And, and we had also the expectation that the methods with short distance channels show stronger signal improvement compared to the methods without short distance channels. So here you can see the mean values um, across triads and subjects of the quality measure um, scaled root mean squared error of the simulated data and the motor execution data, always for IHBO and HBR. And the error bars here represent standard error of the mean. And the stars below the plots here um, represent base factors. So we performed Bayesian statistics here. And here for, yeah, for better, 
yeah, for visual, for better visualization, we restricted um, here our base factor to those indicating evidence supporting the alternative hypothesis. That is that there are differences between the methods and the darker the red color, the stronger the evidence. So for HBO of the semi-simulated data, the results indicate a strong signal improvement across methods. As you can see here, as compared to the uncorrected data, with the lowest um, value resulting from the GLM or method. So for this value, um, we ex if, if we have a good performance of the method, then we would expect a lower value. Um, for the HP of the real data, however, we do not see any of these effects, but instead an increase of the values um, for the methods without short distance channels. For HBR, there was no evidence for differences between any methods. For the correlation data too, we see effects in the semi-simulated data, HBO data, above all, again, the GLMR method, and for HBR, and we see difference between GLM um, correction methods and the uncorrected data. The real HBO data differ only between methods with and without short distance channels and with the methods without short distance channels indicating a reduced correlation. And um, for HBR, we see also a similar, slightly similar pattern, but no effect here. And regarding the, uh, the, the contrast to noise ratio, the pattern for the semi-simulated uh, data is very similar to that of the correlation, as we've seen before for both HBO and HBR. But for this quality measure, um, this effect can also be seen for the uh, real HBO data, which means that the methods with short distance channels differ from the uncorrected data and from the methods without short distance channels. Again, we see a similar pattern for um, HBR, but here there's only an effect between the GLM corrected data and the data corrected with short, uh, without short distance channels. So regarding the spatial specificity, um, we added also um, statistical comparisons. However, we had um, also expectation that focused more on the descriptive level. So for the correlation matrices, we expected after correction, a reduced correlation between normal channels and short distance channels and statistically differences between correction methods and the uncorrected data. And for the topographical beta maps, um, descriptively and statistically a more spatially specific topographical beta map, um, well, we, we expected a more focal pattern after correction that is a strong activation should be visible in regions of interest. For example, for motor execution, we would expect to see a lateralization. So here you can see the averaged um, correlation matrices and the beta maps of the semi-simulated data for HBO in the top row and for HBR in the bottom row, here for the uncorrected data and here for the methods without short distance channels. And as mentioned before, the upper right corner um, of each correlation matrix always corresponds to the short distance channels of the uncorrected data. And the rest of the correlation matrix represents the normal channels of the respective method. So in the uncorrected data, and especially here for HBO, um, the correlations across all channels and between normal channels and short distance channels are very high. And the beta maps show um, strong activation in both simulated channels, but for example, for HBO, there are also a few channels with negative activation. For the um, two methods without short distance channels, the correlations between short distance channels and regular channels are greatly reduced. Um, as we can see here, however, after correction, um, many negative correlations appeared, mainly between the normal channels in the simulated channels in the beta maps um, always resulted in the strongest activation as expected. However, in particular for HBO, we also see many channels um, showing negative activation after correction like more than before in the uncorrected case. In contrast, we see neither negative correlations or nor strongly negative beta values in the beta maps resulting from the correction methods here with short distance channels. 
And especially here for the GLM all method, we see a strong reduction in the correlations between normal channels and the short distance channels. So here we see basically the same figure, but now for the motor execution data and always separately for motor execution of left hand, motor execution of right hand, and then the top part again, HBO and in the bottom HBR. And here starting again with the uncorrected data and the two methods without short distance channels. So again, for the uncorrected data, we see strong correlations across all channels and between normal channels and short distance channels, especially for HBO, which is further confirmed by strong activation of all channels in the beta maps. So we do not see really a good lateralization here in the maps. We also see negative uh, correlations and negative activations for the CAR and the GCR method um, with a slight lateralization pattern um, emerging in the CAR beta maps here. And in the case of the methods with short distance channels, the correlations with short distance channels are again reduced and not negative. And in particular, the beta maps resulting from the two methods and to GLM methods show strongly reduced activations compared to the uncorrected data. And we can, especially here for HBO, see that we have a nice um, lateralization or lateralized activation pattern. So to sum up, um, single trial signal improvement was clearest and most consistent for the semi-simulated data. It was generally higher for methods with short distance channels as compared with methods without short distance channels and of course as compared to the uncorrected data and the overall best performing method was the GLM all um, method. Moreover, um, methods without short distance channels showed in most cases a signal decline um, rather than an improvement which was mostly the case for the real data. So potential reasons for the varying results between semi-simulated data and the real data might be the different signature noise ratio, of course, and also the lacking task-related activation in the short distance channels of the semi-simulated data. Um, regarding spatial specificity, for, we can say that for both uncorrected HBO and HBR um, are affect or were affected with the um, systemic activity artifact. However, the spatial specificity of the HBO data was already much lower as compared with HBR data, which was um, especially evident from very high correlations as well as from strong betas across nearly all regular distance channels. Um, overall methods without short distance channels resulted in negative correlations and negative activation, which is also again a pattern that is highly suggestive of an overcorrection resulting from these methods. Yeah, and to give some um, recommendations, of course, only based on our results and our data, um, we can say that the best performing systemic activity correction method is the GLMR method directly followed by the GLMBH and the SSR method. Um, accordingly, the uh, results indicate that correction performance increases um, with the number of short distance channels, which is actually in line with findings of Santosa and colleagues, for instance, um, who also investigated the effect of the number of short distance channels. So in much more detail than we did. Um, the methods without short distance channels showed a lower performance compared with the methods with short distance channels. And as I said before, tended to overcorrect the data. And based on our results here, and especially if only a limited number of optodes is available, which was the case for us, the CAR method might be slightly better than the GCR method because the over um, correction seems slightly lower and the CAR results in the highest spatial specificity as compared to the GCR method. However, based on the performance results of um, GCR and CAR and given the strong influence of the systemic artifact, um, the application of yeah, either of these or also another correction method should be preferred over the option to, um, yeah, to neglect this correction step. So at the end, you should try to correct um, for, for the systemic activity instead of not doing that. So that would be, yeah, the final word here. Um, 
yeah, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very, very much, Franzi. And I think this is a, this is a good final word. <laughs> we should always correct for, for physiology in general. Yes, so I would leave the room for questions now. So if you have questions, type them in the chat, or you can also raise the hand and then um, call your name and you could ask your question. Otherwise, we also received already some questions online from you. So I would start with this, um, Franzi then. So mm -hmm. um, one of the questions was actually, um, how you could use uh, short channels to correct for data. And you have showed here the SSR and then the GLM methods, either using all the, all the uh, short channels or only some. Um, do you know if there are any other options? I mean, you, you have said there are other options without um, short channels, but do you know of any other um, possibility to, to add a short channel correction, basically, without using the SSR or the GLM? So you mean with short distance channels, so other options with short distance channels? Yeah. Um, yes. So there, I think there are a lot of them at the moment. So there's, of course, the, I mean, the GLM, that's probably also a very simple version you could use, like basically adding all the short distance channels you have. But you could also um, adapt that, for instance, with the TCCA method, uh, where you can also add time shifted versions and then also compare uh, um, combine them with um, other physiological measures, yeah, like, I don't know, heart rate, respiration, whatever you can get, and then create a filter based um, on time shifted versions of all of these um, uh, auxiliary measures. Um, that was shown to be um, even better um, as, in, as compared to only short distance channels. And then there, I think there are also people just using, um, yeah, if you have short distance channels, yeah, calculating basically a PCA of the short distance information and only use um, like the, the, yeah, the, the PCA, PCs that explain most variants. However, I'm, I'm not sure whether that is really a benefit, like, because you're also at the same time neglecting some information. I mean, if you have, or, I mean, if you have only eight short distance channels, I don't see a benefit. If you have like hundreds or something, if you have high density or um, um, these things, then that might be a good idea. But otherwise, I'm not sure if this is really helpful. And um, for the SSR, the short separation regression, there are also other options, right? So we use the version with the closest channel. Um, you can also use a version with the highest correlation um, or the average across all channels, or also again with the PCA approach. So that's also possible. I think there, there are also some other filters you can generate with the short distance channels. Yeah, but I'm not so familiar with those. Um, I think, I'm not sure whether the, uh, the Santosa Pelpa I mentioned, I'm not sure. I, I know that the, in the, the nearest toolbox, there's something implemented, um, but I'm not sure whether they used it for comparison as well in their paper. But um, yeah, I think there are at the moment many options and um, also other, I think there's also this paper by Dominic Weiser where they also added information about Maya waves and also time shifted versions of that and having like a global, an additional global, um, in addition to the short distance channels, something like a global um, regressor, which is I think basically the, the um, average across all channels, like in addition to the other. So, there are so many options. I think there, there's more, there are more comparison or validations necessary to, to find the best solution, I guess, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I think there are a lot of things available out there. Um, so, so then like there was another question um, beforehand also um, asking like, how can you interpret basically the outcome of your either GLM or SSR, whatever correction method you use? And I mean, you showed how you did this in your work, but maybe, um, I mean, the question is like, 
once you do the, the study, how could you judge how good your regression model worked and um, in order to adjust it more on a day-to-day -day basis, I guess, in the lab. So could you recommend like what would be the best uh, method to, to validate your model? Mm. <laughs> I think that's already a tricky question because you um, um, usually don't have any ground truth data, right? So if you if you have your you do your um, experiment and I don't know motor execution left and right is probably an easy one because you have you know like some expectations that um, like the lateralization, for instance, um, if you see that if it gets better or you know then that is a good indication. But if you have other tasks, like for instance, we had also the motor imagery, then it gets more tricky to, to judge whether the performance was good or not so good. And that is, I mean, that is nothing I mentioned here in the paper, uh, in, the, in, the, in the talk, but definitely in the paper, because we were also talking about our um, quality metrics we used. And yeah, that is a, that is actually a tricky question. So I, I like for for um, like really judging whether the influence of the um, short distance channels is reduced. I actually like the visual inspection of the correlation matrices because there you can like see. Um, also, you can also see some overcorrection, spot some overcorrection due to the negative correlations probably. Um, what, although that is also not necessarily that this means uh, all the time overcorrection, but I mean, you could spot that, but you definitely see, as I showed for the um, GLMR method, that the, the correlations between the normal channels and the short distance channels was very, very close to zero, which is, I think, a good indicator that the, your correction worked. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, I think this is very useful already. Amin, you have a question. I feel like you can unmute and just ask directly. Yeah, thanks, Fina. Uh, yeah, thanks for the beautiful talk and the wonderful presentation. Um, it also answers, I think, a couple of our user questions that come up from time to time uh, regarding the selection of, uh, so to say, the best correction method. But, uh, but I think, uh, uh, for myself, from, from my own feedback, I would say I definitely have to uh, to read the paper to understand all the fine details of the of the analysis. But a quick question: I hope it has not been answered yet. Uh, I didn't overhear it. But um, regarding the inclusion of a lot of short channels, would you foresee any potential downside to that? So, in the sense of overcorrecting or like adding multicollinearity to your model, so like having intercorrelated confound predictors in that case. So. Could you say this is a rather very low chance of having this problem, or would you say at some point it might be too much information? So you would, would then rather go to a to an approach that uh, kind of collapses your short channel information into like fewer. I, I mean, on the other hand, uh, would you think it's a good idea as we as we do an fMRI analysis when there are too many confound predictors? We in the end we run some analysis on the model to see if there's no problem our GLM design matrix before we apply it to the data. So it's kind of more of a general question, but uh, you, you, I'm sure you've checked this. Thanks. So, so is your question about adding more than the eight short distance channels, like more and more, and at some point is enough, or and that it might yeah. hurt the question? Yeah, yeah, I would say up to eight or beyond that, because you also mentioned, of course, in the end, adding more. But, but of course, right now, as I understood it, there is. Uh, it's like it's like an unanswered question uh, because uh, on the practical side, I guess we I never saw a data set where there were, were more than eight short channels. But of course, yeah. my experience is fa fairly limited. So I basically just started in FNIRS uh, relatively short while ago. So my question was, is more based on my previous fMRI experience where where we usually uh, at some point said, okay, we add too many motion or other parameters, whatever you you add a huge number of confounds at some point really have to change. If there's a correlation, of course, if you look at something like motion action predictors, they are always to some extent highly correlated. So you have to be really careful there. But I, I guess with short channels, the situation is a bit different. But um, do you think it makes sense to add a step of checking your design matrix in this case, or is it actually not necessary and you can just accept whatever you, you get in there? 
I mean, it's a very, uh, definitely a very interesting question about the number of short distance channels. So I, as you said, there are also, to my knowledge, there's no, um, no paper out there that um, used more than eight short distance channels for the correction yet. Um, but that that were definitely interesting. So as I mentioned, the Santosa paper, they were explicitly looking at this, so like adding more and more channels, but also up to eight channels. And um, they said like they also said like five channels are already also okay, um, but it still improved up to eight, and they would um, predict um, that it's probably also getting better. The, the performance would get better if you add more, but this is of course speculating because they also um, had no chance to check that, but that was very, would be very interesting. Um, about the multicollinearity, I think that is already a problem um, for, with the, also with eight short distance channels, or I don't know whether also with less, but I mean, at the end it's a multicollinearity, it's like, um, so you you mean like the correlation between the regressors, um, um, yeah, within the design matrix? Yes. So it's um, and so the way we are doing it here um, is basically the same way as we would do an online or real time scenario. So we we are using a cleaning GLM. So we do not add the um, task related regressors here. Um, but I also noticed um, very often that if you do the, the short distance correction with the, within the general, um, the, the usually end general in your model, when you also have your task related regressors, then it happens quite often that you have a multi collinearity problem. And I think there's also quite recent paper out there by Helena Cox, and they also described the same problem. And they also recommended to do it, um, you know, like a really a cleaning GLM without the task related regressors. And then if you want another GLM um, for interpreting your results, then do it afterwards again. So um, that's also the way we do it. Um, and I think that this might increase the chance for multicoronality if you if you if you add more regressors and more short distances. And that's very likely, yes. I, I think so. Yeah. And then, I mean there so. is yeah, but there is the, the method I mentioned that might be um, maybe then, um, yeah, I don't know, a solution, but some option you could try is for, for instance, the TCCA method, right? That you have, I don't know, a lot of uh, regressors, not only short distance, but any other regressor. And at some point you have also the same problem, even with um, that you have maybe too many um, regressors at the end. Um, and then you can um, build you the, the, like a spatial filter, like reduce your um, regressors to the ones that correlate most with the data and um, yeah, perform your GLM with analysis with those. That is also an option, I guess. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, thanks so much because it also answers another question I had in mind of, uh, uh, of course, advising because we, we often get the question of would you rather advise to do the cleaning step with the short channels as you described here, or would you better say we do it uh, basically in the course of our GLM at the step yeah. of, of actually model checking, model fitting? So that means uh, yeah. that, that goes into uh, this, this question already. Thanks so much. So yeah. uh, I will have a look at the papers you mentioned. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's, it's also something I have to, um, yeah, I, I don't have the real answer to that, the true answer to that. I think there's also some something that ha that remains to be shown that that the, there's really a difference between the two step GLM and the one GLM and so on. But uh, yeah, similar to the paper I mentioned, uh, we also recognize that problem already. Yeah, that's the only thing I can say. <laughs> Thank you, Franzi. So Andrew has a question, but we have a question also in the chat, which is more about filters. I'm not sure if, if I mean, we are talking more about the short channel uh, regressions um, here. But the, the, the question is basically if you would have any recommendations on how to choose on bandpass filter. But I think you haven't used in your work bandpass filter, right? You have just used the low pass filter, I think. No, we use also the bandpass filter. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, this is like a very special children during naturalistic communication. <laughs> um, I, I would say I have not a specific recommendation on this specific task and, and with children. So I, I think, I don't know, maybe it's helpful. I mean, I don't know whether it really differs 
too much between other tasks and other um, populations, but in that case might be a good read to read the Paola Pinti paper, like from 2018 or something like it's It's really about bandpass filtering in FNES and um, maybe that is helpful here. Perfect, thank you. Andrew. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and, and congrats on the awesome work. Um, I have a question about the, uh, you mentioned the short channels and the 24 participants, I believe that you've selected have, um, they've all had like good eight short channels. In terms of assessing the quality of the short channels, is there a recommendation? So some people do visual inspection of the heart rate peak or try to, you know, fit a gauche into the heart rate peak or cup coupling index. There's so many options out there, but specifically for the short channels, is there a method that you recommend or that you've used? We actually use the same as for the for the regular distance channels, actually. So, um, I always like, um, you know, like. So the the best option, I don't think that this exists, but the best option would be that this would work automatized without any parameter tuning. But um, <laughs> obviously, that doesn't exist yet. And I think the one that is closest to that because it also you know, includes the information about the cardiac position, you know, probably you, you mentioned that already is the scalp coupling index. And um, I think I mentioned that um, it, it, we use the QT new toolbox. I don't know whether you, you know that probably, yes. And that is um, the scalp coupling index um, compared in compare, uh, together with the peak spectral power value, something like that. Um, and, and I don't know, I, I don't see why I don't would not know why there would be a special um, option needed for short distance channels. I mean, at the end, you would also have the the physiological information like the heartbeat, um, in also in the short distance channels. So I think that is quite a nice method um, to use. However, again, we have the parameter tuning problem and. <laughs> um, yeah, that is a different story, but um, I think that the, that's the problem with the Skype coupling index that's quite conservative at the end. Um, but yeah, I don't know what is better to keep more noisy channels or to lose a few more <laughs> good channels. I don't know. So, but yeah, we usually use exactly the same method for both types of channels. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I know we are already a bit over time, but we have still a question in the chat. So I would keep it going and whoever needs to leave, of course, feel free. Um, so uh, we have another question since you used uh, Moda execution, Moda imagery, uh, someone who is interested in what the best brain regions or positions for the optodes would be starting with, a, starting with an experiment EED and FNEWS. Um, motor execution and motor imagery. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's true. I mean, EG, well, has not so much of a spatial, too much spatial information. So only that when you put your EG electrodes on the motor areas does not necessarily mean that you only measure motor um, activation, I would say. And um, for the motor execution and motor imagery data um, regarding the FNIRS, I can um, yeah, recommend, I, mean, I think it's yeah, very usual to use for motor execution, usually a primary motor cortex. You could also use the premotor cortex, very easy to get activation from there for motor execution task. And for motor imagery, um, so we usually, um, expect activation in the supplementary motor area. And we also showed already in some papers that this is possible to, to get um, activation from there while performing motor imagery tasks. I think that it's a bit tricky because there are still, you know, in the literature, motor imagery literature, it's very diverse regarding the, the, um, the primary motor cortex. So some people see activation in the primary motor cortex while performing motor imagery tasks, others don't. Um, so I think for motor imagery, um, SMA is a, is a good one, I would say. But 
yeah that's at least what we used so far and we were quite happy with that and for us it was also very important to use the sma because for new feedback purposes for parkinson's disease for instance you really want to train that specific area and um yeah that's why we chose that i mean it's always it's it's probably also always about the context here so what task do you want to do what emotional energy task what area do you want to um, treat any patients or see some effects for clinical populations and what is the yeah the tricky or the the, the region of interest here basically yeah Thank you. I'm sure this is helpful, Francine. So thank you very much. I don't see more questions from the chat. No, I see a hand. I, I would have one last question more from my side because of curiosity, just because you have found that using all the short channels that you have used, um, uh, like what's the best correction method compared to using less? Uh, and like we also very often get this questions like how many short channels should you place and where should you place them so maybe um, since there are no other questions maybe we could close with that just from your experience or from what you are doing right now from what you have learned so far um, yeah if you could comment on that how many and where to place <laughs> I mean um then it's, it's a hard I mean, question, I know. <laughs> yes, and it is very often also restricted to the number of optos and short distance channels you have, right? <laughs> so as we have learned already, the most people use eight short distance channels. And um, I mean, if you have them, so why not using them? And I think that is also something, um, yeah, also other, other people um, or other papers just said like, it is good to have more short distance channels, but then of course you have to make sure that also all of your short distance channels should have sufficient data quality. And of course, if you have only short, um, um, only a limited number of optodes, let's say we have only eight sources and we want to cover a specific region of interest, then, then we are also very restricted to that area, right? So we cannot measure at any other um, yeah, places on, on the head. Um, I think there was um, also, I don't remember, I think it's also that Dominic Weiser paper where they um, were looking at the homogeneity, so whether is it homogeneously distributed or more heterogeneously, and they said actually it's not so homogeneously, but since we have not no studies yet with I don't know, high coverage, I think that we would need that, like a 32 by 32 um, head uh, coverage and with 32 short distance channels and then see how many we need and how that would differ between different brain areas. So, so that would be a nice study to investigate that, I think. I, I, don't, I would not say that there is an answer to that yet. I would always say like use, of course, all the ones you have, especially in the limited case, and then um, try to keep them as, yeah, keep the quality of the um, channels high and yeah then you should just do your correction <laughs> and if you don't have channels also do some correction yeah exactly i think this is the takeaway from the webinar always the correction if you have good short channels and yeah maybe uh, one of our um, like someone here in the webinar now feels invited to start a whole head study with 32 <laughs> short channels <laughs> who knows <laughs> i would be in <laughs> cool perfect good to know <laughs> thank you very very much francisca for all the great talk and Thanks. i don't see any questions so whenever you have more questions feel free to contact us and you can just write to consulting at nerex.net and we will forward the questions and make sure they get answered thank you very much Thank you also for staying so long, even if we were a bit delayed. And goodbye. <laughs> Bye.